When people think of science, they tend to think of clear facts and decisive reasoning where little can be left to interpretation. This is, of course, what scientists strive for, but unfortunately, it does not always work out that way. The unfortunate reality is that while the principles of science are designed to nullify human fallibility, it's left up to the humans to execute those principles as well as interpret them. Humans simply conduct experimentations under the guidelines of science and interpret the results. This means that it's extremely important to understand how the science is conducted and what limitations exist within the process of experimentation and what the results really mean. The implications of this become clearer when we look at fields of research such as nutrition. Nutrition is vital to the lives of every human. What you put in your body will greatly affect your health and as a result your quality of life. It's a topic that affects everyone and as a result almost everyone has an opinion on it. Hi I'm R. And I'm Jay. And in this video we'll be discussing the limitations and pitfalls in discussions about nutrition science. Let's get into it. Some scientific experiments produce very clear and easy to interpret results. I can place a variety of different materials within an electric circuit and get a direct measure for the electrical resistance of each of those materials. But at the other end of the spectrum, I could conduct an experiment that surveys thousands of people from different demographics on their political views and what news network they listen to. The results of which will take a lot more time and effort to analyze if they could be shown to prove anything at all. The point here is that understanding the experimentation is important to interpreting the results. Understanding this concept is essential to avoiding confusion when reading about the latest scientific topics. Though, before we get ahead of ourselves, it's important to point out that there is a lot of pseudoscience around the topic of nutrition where claims emerge without any scientific studies to back them up at all. A good first step is to ensure that the claim you're looking at has at least some scientific basis before progressing. When information is coming from non-scientific sources such as a Facebook page, YouTube video, blog, or public figure such as David Wolf, then there is a whole new problem that must be addressed, which is the source of the evidence. That isn't to say you can't get valuable information from these resources, well, maybe it is to say that in regards to David Wolf, but it is to say that the source of the evidence used to make assertions is more important than the assertion itself because if a specific testable claim is made without the presence of any evidence there is no reason to accept that claim as true as only once there is enough evidence should we then accept a claim as true or likely true the reason scientific sources are required is because they go through the process of peer review, which requires them to be reviewed by experts before progressing with publication. Additionally, once a peer-reviewed study is published, it is then open to criticisms from other experts in the field who get it retracted if their criticisms are strong enough. This is not present in other sources. Interestingly, this also applies to books. Books don't go through peer review. Hence, it's not actually uncommon for a scientist to not be able to get claims published through peer review, so they do it through book form, which the public perceive as being just as reliable as scientific studies because it's coming from a perceived scientific authority. So, if you read something making specific claims about nutrition without evidence, then you are justified in withholding belief until scientific evidence has been presented. So now, what if there is scientific evidence presented? This is when we can start assessing the veracity of that evidence. Just because something has gone through the peer review process doesn't mean it is inherently right. Don't get us wrong, going through the rigors of peer review is a good thing, but it isn't a perfect filter. Further, a study might exist and people might be referencing it when they make a claim, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the study supports the claims being made. Therefore, it is extremely important to actually read the sources provided to understand if the intentions of the authors actually align with the claims being made using their work. This most commonly takes the form in a paper being published saying that there is a possibility that X could influence Y, but more research is required to confirm the relationship. People then take that paper and start asserting that it proves that X influences Y, despite that being an assertion the authors wouldn't make based off their own paper. A good example of this is a study entitled Developmental Fluoride Neurotoxicity, a Systemic Review and Meta-Analysis, which outlined a possibility of there being a link between the excessive fluoride intake and the reduction in IQ. At no point did the study claim that it has solid proof that this was the case, but it didn't stop people from trying to use the study to claim that. We have actually made a video on this topic, which you can find a link to in the description if you are interested in watching it. Now let's talk specifically about the limitations with nutrition research. 
There are going to be issues to overcome in any field of research when you are trying to achieve accurate and valid data collection. When it comes to areas such as nutrition, this can be considerably more difficult as the field of nutrition deals with many convoluted factors such as biodiversity among populations as well as unreliable methods for acquiring data, such as self-reported dietary intake, but we will discuss these in more depth shortly. One of the most important methods for research in any field is a lab trial. This is because lab trials allow scientists to control for as many factors as possible when conducting experimentation allowing for the isolation of specific mechanisms in order to directly measure the effect of one thing interacting with another. This is what allows researchers to make confident inferences from the data they collect and leads to further research based on the new understanding of the field. In nutrition, lab trials can be conducted to find the acute effects of specific nutrients on the human body. It's simple enough to give a controlled amount of food or a supplement to an individual and measure the biological effects over the next 24 hours. However, this only grants a small window into the true effects of nutrition and things begin to get exponentially more difficult to control with the extended time frames and larger population sizes. Looking at the long-term effects of nutrition is essential for determining the efficacy of nutritional intervention. This is different to say a medical trial investigating a certain drug, because in the case of testing a drug, you can provide one group with a drug and one with a placebo, let them go on and live their lives, and then return after a period of time to assess the results. In terms of nutritional intervention, both groups will be eating food that will vary considerably, and it relies on the participants strictly maintaining their set diet constantly to maintain the validity of the study. What participants do in everyday life has a very meaningful impact on the outcome of the study, and incorrect applications of the intervention or control can work to invalidate entire data sets. And what's worse is because the subjects aren't being constantly observed, the investigators have to rely on them correctly self-reporting their diet and other measures, which has been shown to be extremely unreliable. Many nutritional studies which examine the efficacy of different diets or specific foods on large populations do so through simple epidemiological studies. The most common type of epidemiological study is an observational study. These can be separated into three distinct categories. The first of which being descriptive studies. In this method, researchers select a population with a specific disease or other attribute and then examine their nutritional intake and attempt to observe any correlations. The nutritional intake is most commonly collected via self-reporting. Descriptive studies do not involve any experimental intervention. They only serve to describe possible correlations between nutritional factors and specific health outcomes. A good example of this is a study from the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, which examined the self-reported exercise and dietary habits of men and women from the National Weight Control Registry and correlated those exercise and dietary habits with weight loss and maintenance of lost weight. When interpreting the results from this study and studies like it, it is important to understand that whilst correlations may be observed, it isn't hard proof of causation, as the correlation could be due to confounding factors or even just coincidence. What studies like this one do provide is a direction for further research to focus on, in order to demonstrate a mechanism which could explain the correlations observed. Unfortunately, this fact is often missed when interpreting results of these types of studies, particularly in the media who often report correlations as strong evidence of a direct relationship. Secondly, we have case control studies or retrospective studies, where the nutritional intake of a specific group is evaluated and compared to a control group. These groups are then compared to see if there are any differences that could be associated with the outcome in question. An example of this type of study from the Prostate Journal examines the relationship between nutrition and prostate cancer. The study involves two similar groups, however one group has prostate cancer and the other does not, and then examines their health outcomes and nutritional intake. Using this information, it searches for significant differences between the groups which could account for the presence of prostate cancer. It is worth noting that whilst a difference may be present, it doesn't necessarily prove that the difference influenced the outcome in question. This still requires further research and confirmation of mechanisms. Lastly, a cohort or prospective study follows a selected population or demographic and compares exposed groups with unexposed, observing the emergence of subsequent disease or other outcomes. A good example of this type of study, also from the British Medical Journal, examined a population of over 700 middle-aged men and compared their blood serum lipoprotein profile over six years to instances of heart disease. This study compared the liposerum profile of those who suffered from heart disease to those who did not and observed a strong correlation between high cholesterol and heart disease. These studies should be interpreted in a similar way to the descriptive studies in that they provide a possible causation and relationships but do not serve as a solid proof of relationship by themselves. 
However, in the case of blood cholesterol and heart disease, where there exists both a large number of descriptive and case control studies, as well as a tested potential mechanism for the relationship between these factors, we can say there is a very strong case for the causal relationship between them. The important thing to remember is that we can confidently say this only because of the multitude of independently observed correlations combined with a mechanism which explains the relationship. Despite this, the relationship is still contested and new evidence could change our understanding of these correlations. In addition to observational studies, experimental epidemiological studies can also be conducted, in which two or more populations are compared with one population or group, given an experimental intervention, and then the outcomes are examined in the same manner as an observational study would. Essentially, an experimental epidemiological study is conducted in the same manner as an observational study, with the only difference being one group is following a procedure provided to them by the researchers, which should influence the two populations. Whilst these studies do include an intervention, like standard lab trials, they lack the rigorous control that accompanies lab trials. As such, they are still open to problems with covariates influencing results. And whilst the study may control for some covariate, it is not possible for them to control for all possible covariates. This does not invalidate experimental epidemiological studies, but it does outline a standard limitation that needs to be taken into consideration when interpreting the data yielded by them. Whilst this can be overwhelming, there is an easy takeaway from it. Epidemiological studies involve taking information from very large population groups and then making comparisons between the groups to find any differences or correlations. Those differences or correlations are then used to make hypotheses about potential causal relationships. The limitations of epidemiological research studies are also fairly simple to summarize. Indeed, epidemiological studies do not provide mechanisms for causation, but instead possible relationships between variables. Whilst the correlations or differences observed may seem to be convincing, it is very difficult, maybe even impossible, to actually account for the necessary covariates to ensure that the outcome being observed is genuinely because of the variable in question and not some other or group of other variables. The potential for unconsidered covariates exponentially rises the more different the two populations are, especially given the difference in genetic diversity between different people of similar demographics. There is a magnitude of difference between comparing two groups of people who live in the same area and comparing health outcomes of different countries. Given there are already serious risks of uncontrolled variables when comparing people who live in the same town, comparing people on the opposite sides of the globe is often untenable. Additionally, let's take the example of comparing vegans to the general population. In the vegan group, you have a group which cares about their nutritional intake enough to follow a specific diet which is highly restrictive. It would be faulty to compare them to the general population, as whilst the general population may include people who follow a balanced, thoughtful diet, it will also include people who eat McDonald's 10 times a week. It would be more functional to compare two groups that follow a specific diet than rather to the general population population. Surprisingly, it is very common for epidemiological studies to compare to the general population, despite this limitation. This is likely due to the convenience of the comparison. All these results show is that a specific intervention is better than the average of the general population. The general population is actually surprisingly unhealthy, so if someone tries to use this evidence to claim that one specific diet is better than another, it is likely a faulty claim. So, after hearing about the different types of epidemiological studies and their limitations, I suspect you might be asking, why is so much nutrition research epidemiological? The answer is simple, but likely won't be satisfying. It's because of convenience. Because nutrition interventions often take so long to have an effect, it is not practical or ethical to keep people in a completely controlled environment for such periods of time. In rare cases, researchers conduct ward studies where participants will live in a controlled environment or at least eat all their meals under laboratory conditions for a longer period of time than a standard lab trial. Whilst these can be counted as lab trials, it's still not realistic to retain people for long enough to get meaningful results on many topics such as nutrition and disease prevention. If you understand these limitations, you can evaluate these results critically and then better understand what claims are realistic or unrealistic when it comes to research results. It is also worth noting that the relative importance of certain measures in epidemiological studies can be very subjective, especially in terms of weight loss. If the only goal of a diet is to lose weight, then there is an easier way to lose weight. Just saw your legs off. Without your legs, you'll lose around 40% of your body mass, which is much faster than any diet. I'm assuming you aren't enthusiastic about sawing your legs off, despite the undeniable weight loss it would give you. And the reason for that is there is more to weight loss than numbers off a scale. 
most of the time, weight loss is to maximize health outcomes. So a diet that promotes the loss of lean muscle mass and the retention of body fat but reduces overall weight is not preferable to one that maintains or increases lean muscle mass and reduces body fat. An example where this logic can be applied is a ketogenic diet. With a ketogenic diet, the heaviest part of the muscle tissue, the store of glucose or glycogen, is lost. In addition to this, maintaining lean body mass becomes difficult with a myriad of studies demonstrating this. Both the loss of muscle mass and glycogen will result in weight loss, but not the weight loss desired. Now, what about when it comes to long-term dietary outcomes and athletic performance? There are many claims about what diets will maximize exercise performance, but for the most part, if you meet your total energy requirements, there isn't likely to be a huge difference between different diets. The primary factor comes down to carbohydrates. Whilst proteins are essential for tissue growth and recovery, in terms of sports performance, carbohydrates are essential because they are the only energy source that can be yielded anaerobically. Anaerobic energy is essential for high intensity activity as it yields energy quickly. Fats are broken down through a process called beta oxidation and they enter the Krebs cycle and are then aerobically broken down, which is a much slower process. Now, whilst lower carbohydrate diets do show an increase in the efficiency of fat breakdown, there isn't evidence to suggest that this will overcome the detriments of having minimal anaerobic capacity. Even studies in competitive race walkers have shown that at a relatively low intensity, carbohydrates are still essential for sports performance. The most important things regarding long-term dietary interventions and sports performance is sufficient quality protein to maximize recovery and the appropriate balance of fats and carbohydrates to allow for the function of both the anaerobic and aerobic energy systems. Short-term nutrition is a different ballpark that is outside the scope of this video. But assessing short-term nutrition outcomes such as carbo loading is much easier to assess than long-term nutrition as it's a short controllable intervention on a very specific acute performance output. So all in all, where does this leave us with nutrition-based claims? Well, it leaves us in a position where there are a great many claims that we can't make with a great degree of confidence. What we can do is make some suggestions about what may improve health and maximize weight loss, but we need to be very careful that we aren't making claims that are more specific than the actual collected data. The safest way to operate here is to ensure any claim being made has sufficient evidence to make that specific claim. Maybe there is evidence to suggest that a specific diet is healthier than what the average person in the population does. That doesn't, however, mean that we should incorporate that diet over all others. As much as we would like to be able to finish on a paragraph where we can bring all of this together into one easily digestible and useful conclusion, that sadly isn't possible. These limitations exist. They don't invalidate nutrition research, they just exist. And their existence must be considered in any discussion on the topic. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for regular videos. If you love the channel and want to support it, head to our Patreon page. Remember to like this video and share it around to help us raise the bar of public discourse.